What I'd like to talk about in this video is why I think teachers should podcast. And the way I'd like to do that is simply share my path and what I've found along the way. In a real general sense, the path I followed initially started with just replicating the classroom. I then moved on to seeing that creating YouTubes removed some barriers to learning that kind of put holes in our education system in a sense. Then I'd like to move on to crowd accelerated innovation, a term coined by Chris Anderson in the TED Talk that I'll bring up later. And basically his point is by sharing things through video, it enhances the speed of innovation. There's certain tasks, certain skills that you need to be able to see in order to improve on. And I think teaching is one of those things. His example is riding a unicycle. Only through seeing other people ride a unicycle can you improve or innovate. And video, sharing videos on YouTube, allows more people to see that skill, and so that skill will innovate more quickly. I think teaching is the same way. It's hard to write down what you do in a classroom, but it's pretty easy to record it, share it with others, so then others can see how you teach, I can see how others teach, and that will speed the process of innovation because I can pick things that work for me and other people can share the things I do to build their skills, so to speak. So one of the first things I guess that I've found is it's paradigm shift after paradigm shift. So again, following this path, following my path or sharing my path, is just meant to allow you to kind of pick the paradigm shift that you may like to follow as well and pick up just the things that you will necessarily want to pick up. So where I'm going to start is over here and replicate the classroom and essentially go through some of the different types of videos because one of the first questions is where do I start? And to me, where you start kind of depends on the size of the picture or the amount of pictures that you're trying to replicate to put on a video. And what I mean by that is you might have many pictures in the form of a PowerPoint. You may have kind of a small picture that you just like to record, something small that you draw on the board. Maybe it's a large drawing you put on the board or fairly detailed. And then sometimes I do really, really detailed illustrations and that requires a different strategy. Another thing I'm trying to show on here is you have basically three different options. You can use cheap and less processing power and they're easier. You can use high resolution, high flexibility, and then you can also use kind of a middle ground. I would consider Camtasia a middle ground. And you'll notice that Camtasia, I think, will allow you to do all the different podcasts. So that's the tool that I use. On a very simple level, again, if you just have PowerPoints that you'd like to record an audio track to, PowerPoint has a screen capture and narrative function. So you can just record a narration along with the PowerPoint. In fact, you can hook up a wireless microphone. Back when I started four years ago, the only wireless microphones were like an Xbox microphone. And so I would use an Xbox microphone over the ear to record narration while I lectured. Camtasia is also a nice tool because you can capture the screen in a PowerPoint while you're recording. Kind of a smaller picture, not anything too detailed. You can use a standard webcam, and in fact, you can use just standard webcam software without editing as long as you do things in one take. If you have a little bit more detail, you want a little bit more detail, an HD webcam is nice too, and they're only about $50 at this point. And they will also come with software that would allow you to edit. Camtasia, again, I think is a little bit more simple. If you have kind of a bigger picture with more detail, I think you need to move to definitely an HD webcam instead of a standard webcam. And again, you can still edit with Camtasia. You can edit with webcam software, the software that came with it. Or you can just use Microsoft's video editing software as well to edit those videos. If you're going to record a lecture, you kind of need a digital video camera. You might be able to use a webcam, but you don't always get the frame rates, the speed. They'll look jittery if you don't have a DV camera. So a DV camera is nice. The problem with a DV camera is this is the one thing that Camtasia doesn't really do too well in my experience. So you have to move up to a higher order processing software. And I should say at this point that I use Adobe Premiere and that's because I'm PC. I know, I know. I grew up on Mac and I know that Mac is generally easier to edit video on. But I don't really know much about Macintosh and that's why I'm not discussing Mac software. If you have a really big picture, and by this I'll show an example, really, really detailed illustrations, you kind of have to draw those out in advance and then screen capture. So like what I'm doing today, it's too big to draw out. So I've drawn it out on Prezi and I'm doing a screen capture with Camtasia. Adobe Captivate is probably a little bit more powerful, but again, it's a little bit more difficult. There are free versions like Jing, but Jing is limited to five minutes. And Camp Studio is a free version for Microsoft. It works relatively well, but I don't think it's as easy and as powerful as Camtasia. Essentially, when looking down this list, there's trade-offs. And here's how I see the trade-offs. I think on the high end of software, you have the Adobe software, 
which is difficult to master. It obviously costs quite a bit. It's much more flexible and much more powerful, and you can do high resolution a lot easier. It's going to take more processing time and power, so you're going to need a good computer in order to run Adobe software. At the lower end, I would say Microsoft software, just filmmaker software. It's easier to use, it's low cost, it's not as flexible, and you might not be able to do high resolution, but it's also going to require less processing, so you'll save on the computer as well. I find Camtasia to be right in the middle. It's relatively simple, but it's pretty powerful. The cost is about $179 for an educator, and it doesn't require quite as much processing as Adobe software does. So that's where to start, and now I'll show you some examples. So again, I started doing this about four years ago because I know students wanted to hear the PowerPoint again, or maybe preview the PowerPoint. So in this case, I'm doing many pictures, and I'm just doing PowerPoint screen capture. You can do this in Camtasia, or PowerPoint has the narration function too. After you've recorded an audio PowerPoint, you can share that with students on, it, on its own, or you can convert that to a movie file for play on an iPod with something called Moye software. It's a M-O-Y-E-A, Moye software. When you decrease freezing, that causes an increase in CO2. So here's just an example of how those videos would, would look. It's just a simple PowerPoint, and I've recorded an audio file to it and posted it to YouTube as a movie file. So that's many pictures, PowerPoint narration. If you have kind of a low resolution drawing, again, you can use a standard webcam or an HD webcam. I've moved up to HD webcams because they're anywhere from $50 to $100 at this point, which is relatively cheap. It also integrates better with Camtasia so that you can record immediately with the HD webcam and edit right away as well. Oh, the Maryland filtration rate. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I don't so skipped ahead a little bit to show that this is kind of a low resolution drawing. This is in fact one of the first YouTubes that I ever did. Did it in one take, did it with the software that came with the webcam. So it can be done that way. But it's kind of a bigger picture that I wanted to draw out for students and students would request that I repeat it. And so it was just easier to put it on YouTube. So I only had to draw it in class once and then they could view it multiple, multiple times. I think that's one of the motivations I'll talk about later with YouTube is Many, many students were reporting that they understood something in class, but then they'd get home and look at their notes and they just wish they could hear it one more time. So putting things on YouTube solved that problem for me. They can listen to it multiple times after they've seen it in class. So that's picture drawings, low res with webcam. I think you require higher resolution if you're going to record the board. And so larger hand-drawn or recording a lecture requires an HD webcam. And again, the beauty of an HD webcam is that you can use the easier software products like Camtasia. If you move up to DV, I think you need to move to higher order software like Adobe Premiere, which has a considerable learning curve to it. So I skipped ahead a little bit just to show that this is quite a detailed drawing on the board. And so it does really kind of require HD or high definition. So that's DV camera. Here's an example of kind of the same thing. So now I'm using the HD webcam. For the nursing or pre-nursing student introduction. Again, the beauty of the HD webcam is it's a little bit fuzzy. It's not as nice as a DV camera, but it's so much easier to edit with a webcam because you can stop and start and edit immediately. Whereas with a DV camera, you've kind of got to record it all. Then you've got to put it into software and edit it at that point. I find it a lot easier to edit and record at the same time. So you can stop and edit and then move on. So that's HD webcam. The last type of video that I do is when it's a highly detailed drawing. So a really big picture or a detailed illustration. You kind of need to screen capture. You can use Adobe Captivate. Again, I like Camtasia. It's what I'm using now. Cam Studio is software that's free, but I don't find it as powerful. And then Jing is limited to five minutes. If you do a simple Wikipedia search of screen capture software, there's probably 40 or 50 different softwares available. At least 15 or 20 of them are probably free, and there's also reviews. Again, there's times when I want to just create a large document. So these are all the cranial nerves, where they're located, what they're called, what they control, and what happens when they go wrong. It's a really nice document to put together into one picture. It would take pages and pages to write this out. And so I think this is one of the benefits of using YouTube, is you can create a spatial map of something and record it. But this does require screen capture, in my opinion. It's difficult to draw this out in detail. Function of the cranial nerves, the names of the cranial nerves, the individual functions of each. A nice thing about it is then the student can get both. So they can look at the figure 
and they can listen to a narration at the same time. In fact, I'll usually put these figures on the More Info tab of the YouTube so that students that are watching the videos can download the images as well. So those are big, big picture figures or highly detailed illustrations. So that's basically how I have attempted to replicate the classroom. Next, I'd like to talk about how I think doing YouTubes or creating small videos removes certain barriers to learning. And if you remove those barriers, you open up some new avenues of teaching, so to speak. I'll talk about that the last step, but first of all, I'd like to just talk about the barriers. I think one of those barriers is that essentially anyone that's trying to learn something requires a certain amount of repetition. The brain doesn't really like novelty, and so it needs some repetition before it can acquire that information. Next, once you've repeated it and you've started to understand it, you need further clarification. And a final step is just to make it all make sense through a summary. The thing I like about YouTube is it allows the student, any student, to repeat as often as they need to. And that's essentially why I started to do the YouTubes in the first place, is it allowed easier repetition. I think obviously teachers lecture a certain reason because they think that's different than the textbook, but then the student only gets to hear that one time. They don't really get to repeat the information in the lecture. And so creating YouTubes allows the student to repeat. I think, as I kind of alluded to just a second ago, I think that's important because novelty learning is difficult. And so being able to hear something a second or a third time improves your ability to, to figure out kind of where the pieces fit together and then start to understand the material better. So I think if the first time a student is hearing information is in the classroom and they don't have a chance to come back and review that material, it's very, very difficult to acquire all that information. So again, I think this repetition process is key. And if you can get this repetition to occur before the class or outside of the class, so in the class you can do the clarification and summary, I think that would lead to better learning. Another thing I like about creating YouTube is that it allows differentiated instruction. So some students will get through this process much, much quicker than other students, and they may feel unstimulated at that point. So for a more advanced student that needs more information, in order, to stay, in order to stay engaged and stay stimulated, I like creating YouTubes that allow differentiated instruction. So I would say approximately 20% of my videos are not necessarily required for my students, but if they're advanced, if they know they're going to work on a cardiac floor and want to know about ECG, if they'd like to go deeper into urinalysis because they're interested in electrolytes or they have a history of kidney failure or know somebody with kidney failure, then there's additional videos that are still in the same kind of teaching style that I use but would advance their understanding beyond necessarily what every student needs to acquire in my class. So I like, and one of the main reasons I use YouTube is to allow students to repeat multiple times outside of the classroom so that more time in classroom can be spent clarifying and summarizing information. I think also I teach face-to-face, -face, which creates certain limits on the student. They only have access to me during their semester, whereas if I create YouTubes and they've used those YouTubes to learn in class, that YouTube will still be there for review when they move on to more advanced classes. So for example, if I teach electrolytes using YouTube and the student has acquired that information while in my course, they can also come back and see it taught again in a very similar style, obviously identical style, when they're dealing with electrolytes in their nursing courses. So it allows an easier review. In fact, that's one of the reasons I started doing YouTube in the first place is because Kirkwood had kind of a wait list between my course and when the student would get into the nursing course. And so I created YouTube so the student would be able to review their AMP anatomy and physiology material before they got into their nursing courses or when they were in their nursing courses, since it might have been a couple of years between the AP course and their nursing courses. The other thing about YouTube is it increases access. The only time a student can access me, well, outside of class, but in general, is on the Cedar Rapids main campus. By creating YouTube videos, the student can watch videos they can learn while they're picking up their kid from gymnastics, while they have a free moment here or there. So it improves access. In face-to-face -face courses, the student really is only learning at this certain time. And your brain might not always be functioning at a maximal level when the course is. For me, an important part of doing any kind of task is can you choose when you do it? Can you choose, this is a time when it's good for me because my brain is functioning. Maybe you've worked all night, maybe a student has worked all night, and 10 to 10.50 a.m. is not going to be an optimal time for them to learn. If I can create YouTube videos, they can watch those videos when they're awake and alert. The other problem with lecture-type courses is you want to generate content. You want to be able to convey content, 
but the human brain really only works for 15 minutes of concentration. How do you get around that? Well, you create 15 minute videos on YouTube so that the student can attend to that amount of information for 15 minutes. I think that's also one of the advantages of using YouTube and putting things in 15 minute lessons as opposed to necessarily lecture capture. Lecture capture still kind of demands that the student attend for a certain long period of time. Whereas if you create lessons that are 15 minutes, you're right in that window of human concentration. Another thing that I've really noticed in myself and also in my students is it's really invaluable to have information on a mobile device. It's kind of a paradigm shift in and of itself because I can now learn when my hands are busy but my brain is free. So when I'm cleaning out the garage or I'm mowing the lawn, I can listen to an iTunes U lecture on specific anatomy and physiology content or how to teach. It's the same for the student. If the student can listen to the lecture material wherever they are, whenever they have their phone, that considerably improves access. Because now they don't necessarily have to have a quiet place where they're sitting and reading a textbook, but they can listen to information anywhere. I'll come back to that. Life intervenes, especially in community college. And so if a student is not necessarily having a good day, if they're having a bad day and they miss class, and the only way for them to really hear that information is in lecture, then they've just lost that information. Can't really expect perfect attendance, but I also don't want to accept that when a student misses that day, that they're not going to get that information some other pathway. So YouTube allows the student to learn the information they lost on a bad day by picking it up through YouTube. Again, if a student normally misses class and you tell them, well, go back and read your book, I think as an instructor, the reason we lecture is we don't necessarily trust that the book is conveying all the information that the lecture is. But realizing that, when the student misses the lecture, they're missing that information in the way that you'd like to convey it. But if you can put it on YouTube, then that will hopefully make up for that. I had one semester in, in January where four of the six long lecture days, two-hour lecture days, were canceled due to snow days. But because I had most of my lectures on YouTube, I didn't really miss that much information. The student was able to still review the content. So life intervenes, but YouTube can make up for that. Learning styles. I haven't progressed a long way down this path, but this cartoon is obviously taking off on a quote from Einstein that to paraphrase says that if you ask a fish to climb a tree it's gonna look pretty stupid. I think asking students to learn in particular learning styles might also limit their abilities. Students have different learning styles and so trying to use video to create different methods of teaching to those learning styles I think benefits students. I haven't had a whole lot of chance to create a lot of videos to do this but I see it on my path in the future. For example this is a video from a colleague at Kirkwood who's prepping a lab. What I want to do in this video is to introduce you to some of the that you'll be using in your PV92 PCR lab. Uh, so here's the equipment. So just to... The thing I particularly like about this video is the student is seeing exactly what they're set up. Now if you were to write that down on paper, write that out in instructions, it's going to be a lot more difficult to see. But he's going to increase his efficiency in that class considerably by showing the student what needs to be set up visually. Then he'll go through kinesthetically and demonstrate what the particular actions are that the student will need to perform in order to perform that lab. Another benefit I see from putting videos on YouTube is that the student that has English as a second language can hear the lecture material over and over. And it can hopefully make up for some of the language difficulties of the course. So those are some of the learning style improvements I think occur when you put videos on YouTube or create podcasts. Other learning barriers, I think it speeds us along Bloom's taxonomy. I like this kind of breakdown of Bloom's taxonomy that knowledge comprehension and application are essentially training, but synthesis analysis and evaluation are education. I think any YouTube video that can help us get through the training phase so that we can move up to the education phase is going to benefit the student in the long run. We're going to push them up into the evaluation and creation stage. So when I see this kind of breakdown of Bloom's taxonomy and different web 2.0 tools, notice that YouTube basically can do all of these. It can help the student remember by reviewing. It can help the student evaluate because watching YouTubes is not necessarily the best source of information but as long as you understand that one of the things we're trying to do is teach evaluation, then YouTube's an awesome tool. 
I really like this figure. I found this figure from this publication. It's on the theory underlying concept maps. And what I really like about it is it demonstrates rote learning really has little or no relevant knowledge. There's really no emotional commitment. If you can move the student up to meaningful learning with well-organized material, and if the student is emotionally committed, you can then progress on to creative productions, which I think is probably the highest order of learning, is taking on information, seeing connections that other people may not see, but valid connections. And that's how I define creativity, is having such a grasp of the information and the knowledge that you can see connections that other people do not see. The only way I think you can get up to creative productions, though, is if you can organize content, you can make it accessible to the students, so first you have meaningful learning. So again, similar to similar to above, if you want to move into these higher orders of cognitive domains, I think you need to simplify application comprehension and knowledge. Another way that I think about this is any time that I can simplify the learning of information, I can expect higher order thinking. Anytime I can simplify the learning of facts, I can expect higher order thinking. So anytime I can make this simpler, I can expect more of this. As a teacher, I understand that I'm given a certain amount of frustration that I can expect from the student. Anytime I make learning simpler by putting videos on YouTube and lessen the frustration, I can reintroduce that frustration by expecting greater commitment, greater content knowledge. So essentially, anytime that I make learning easier, I can expect more from that student. And I think that creating YouTube videos makes learning easier for students. So those are learning barriers. Of course, the question then is, is why don't you just rely on the textbook? Because textbooks allow information to be conveyed outside of the classroom. My thought on reading textbooks is that there's some limits that textbooks introduce. First of all, in the human brain, we're kind of wired to listen and hear. The areas that listen and hear are clustered together around the temporal lobe, whereas vision is back in the occipital lobe. And this makes certain amount of sense because the human brain has been listening and hearing for 80,000 years, but we've only really been reading for 600 years since the printing press. So I would argue that our brain is much more adapted to see and hear than it is to read. If so if you can simplify learning by making it audio and visual, I think you can improve learning. I think this recognition too will create kind of a paradigm shift in learning. Because even as recent as 10 years ago, the most efficient storage of lots and lots of information is pen to paper, because it's the only way to store a lot of information in a small volume of space. But now with the advent of computer and cheap computer space, it's so much easier to store video. At this point, it's easier to store video electronically than it is to print a book. And so I think there's probably going to be a shift back mentally from reading to listening. I know if I want to learn a particular piece of software and the website offers me a video or I can read about how to use that software, I'm almost always going to choose the video because I think it's easier for me to learn. And I think that's going to be true of most of our students moving forward. I alluded to this earlier, but I think the environment necessary for reading is quite a bit different than the environment necessary to listen or watch. Because listening or watching a YouTube video, you can do that when your hands are busy, but your mind is free. So it creates a much more wider availability, a much more broad learning environment than necessarily just a reading environment. Another thing that I think severely limits textbooks is that they're very linear. While our brains tend to be spatial, neurons are organized in spatial maps. And so again, I come back to this image where if I were to type this out, it's going to be much longer and much more linear. It's going to be more difficult for many students to wrap their brain around. Whereas if I create a picture and it kind of radiates out spatially and information gets more detailed as I move out, I think this is a much easier way for many students to learn. So those are limits of the textbook that I think are solved by moving to more of an audiovisual video that's posted as a YouTube. So those are some of my thoughts, things that I've found on how I believe that YouTube removes certain barriers to learning. Next up will be how I think YouTube will increase crowd accelerated innovation in teaching. So how I think teaching will change with the increased usage of video. First of all, by removing barriers, I think it means not accepting certain holes in understanding. So if a student misses a particular day of class because life has intervened, and that lecture was meant to complement the textbook or complement other understanding, the student's not going to get that information any other way at that point, other than sitting down with the student and re-lecturing it to him. So essentially, there's going to be a hole in that student's understanding. 
I think there's a growing realization that as instructors, we need to move beyond objective-based teaching to competency-based learning. And by objective-based teaching, I mean we have a certain number of facts or objectives that we have written down that we need to convey to our students. And then we're going to challenge the students, and whoever gets the most information, whoever remembers the most of those objectives, is going to get the higher grade. Whereas in competency-based learning, we're going to set up a certain amount of skills or competencies that the student needs to be able to perform in order to be successful at the next level, whether that's a job or a future program. So I think the idea behind competency-based learning and teaching for excellence has been around for a while, but I think Khan Academy is one of the first instances where video is used to actually put those methods into place. The student cannot miss a particular area without being reminded that they've missed that area. And so there's no Swiss cheese kind of learning at this point. The student will know and will have to revisit competencies that they haven't covered. I think this is going to change the way we grade, too, the current way that we grade is we give a certain number of objectives and then whoever performs those objectives the best gets the higher grades and whoever performs the objectives the least well gets the lower grades. Historically speaking, and I don't want to sound politically incorrect, but this has been a fine model because we needed an industrial worker as well. We needed the captains of industry and we needed the industrial worker. And we needed the blue collar worker and we needed the white collar worker. But I think that model is probably changing in the States. Because if you look at populations like China and India, their top 10% is greater in number than our entire population. And so we can't focus on necessarily our top half of students. We need to focus on all of them and move them all up in competencies. So I think video will help us remove barriers so that we no longer accept holes in understanding. And I think that will free us up to competency-based learning as opposed to objective-based learning. One of the obvious statements that always is going to come up in any talk of pedagogy is should you be the sage on the stage or should you be the guide on the side? There's not enough time to be both. So should you lecture material or should you rely on the student reading the book and then be the guide on the side? Given my opinions on textbook limitations, I've always chosen more to be the sage on the stage because I thought I could describe, create content, put together a bigger picture of the information if I could lecture the material. But through YouTube, I can be the sage on the stage and the guide on the side. So this is a quote that I found from an educator named Joe Bauer. And incidentally, I found Joe Bauer by listening to a reform symposium lecture from iTunes U. So again, I choose to listen to information while my hands are busy, but my brain is free. So while cleaning out my garage, I was able to listen to this video. And it's a very interesting quote. Students should experience success and failure not as reward and punishment, but as information. I really like that. The usage of video allows me to deliver content, be the sage on the stage outside of class, so that I can be the guide on the side in class. It frees up time to give more information rather than necessarily convey and rather than necessarily conveying information as reward and punishment through grades. I think any educator should be a big fan of Coach John Wooden. I don't want to make huge parallels between coaching and teaching, but I think any good teacher will also see themselves as has a coaching role. I think it's interesting to note that psychologists at one time broke down the different information that John Wooden would share with his players, and 75% of that information was detailed specific information to the individual. The other 25% were just requests of motivation, essentially. 7% were praise, and only 6% were scoldings. So again, if I can jump back real quick, John Wooden probably best exemplifies this quote, that students should experience success and failure as information, not as reward and punishment. So I think one of the huge advantages of YouTube is you get to be the sage on the stage and the guide on the side. There's a very good TED talk of John Wooden that is very much worth your time, in my opinion. Next up, I think the usage of YouTube allows a different type of textbook. So not necessarily a written textbook, but a spatial textbook. So here I've clicked over to a different Prezi and in this Prezi presentation, I 
I've kind of outlined Bloom's Taxonomy. And I should probably update to the more recent Bloom's Taxonomy. But basically, I've outlined really simple knowledge on the inside. If you're teaching the heart, the student needs to know gross anatomy. They need to know vessels. They need to know the cardiac cycle, which is how electricity goes through the heart. They need to talk about the layers of the heart because you can have pericarditis and then the heart valves. And as you move out, you can start to talk about comprehension. And you can add further layers of application. And the thing I like about YouTube is then you can embed videos into the Prezi presentation so that essentially the student is radiating out following Bloom's taxonomy. An important part of this is you could see that when you get out past evaluation, or again, this would be the creativity and the newer Bloom's derivation, you could continue on these circles continuously into future coursework. So I teach anatomy and physiology. My students are going to be heading into nursing programs or other health programs. So you can imagine that you would continue to radiate out these circles so that while I've taught the student the basic anatomy or perhaps the cardiac vessels, they will learn, then learn about cardiac arrest and heart attack. And at the outer circles, they would learn how nurses are to take care of patients with cardiac arrest and heart attack. So now jumping back into the Prezi on why I think YouTube should be used by teachers. Just to follow up, I think that YouTube videos can integrate to create spatial textbooks. My future vision of this would be to create textbooks that then assess competencies with each video. So the student could follow through, listen to a video, and assess their competencies and receive feedback. Another thing I really like about posting YouTubes is you're educating the world. It, it's a social cause in some ways. So you can view how many videos are viewed around the world if you're educating other countries. And anyone that loves to teach really loves to teach. So as someone that loves to teach, I love to see this number. This is the number of times my videos have been viewed. And they're not necessarily just jumped in and jumped out of because YouTube will also give you information on how long your videos have been viewed. So some of these videos have links into them, like this one has links in it, so the student will jump out of the video. But to know that a video is watched 80% of the way through for 50,000 times is kind of interesting as a teacher. I really like to know that I've given 53,000 53, lectures on glomerular filtration, so to speak. Or that something like 50,000 people have watched the cranial nerve lectures most of the way through. And again, there's no way to say this without really sounding braggardly. But I have to admit, there's going to be a sense of pride when this number hits a million, and I've delivered a million lectures, a million lessons to people around the world. And the lectures really are viewed around the world. So with YouTube, you can break down which countries are viewing what. And just to know that 12,000 videos have been viewed in Africa, of course, they're not all third world because you need a computer to view them. But just to know that you've educated people around the world as a teacher is a source of pride, in my opinion. So I mentioned earlier, this TED Talk. From Chris Anderson. And in this talk, he talks about crowd accelerated innovation. I would highly recommend watching this video. The main point is, is sharing your videos will improve innovation in teaching. <laughs> I get another video worth seeing is Salman Khan talk about the Khan Academy. Again, he talks about how video can revolutionize education, and I believe that it truly can. So again, I think video is going to cause us to step our game up as educators. That's a quote from the Chris Anderson video. It's going to lead to crowd-accelerated innovation. Now, of course, I think that probably gives pause to educators because there's concern that video will replace the teacher. But I really don't think that that's true. I think video will demand more teaching. I don't think any instructor has lost their job due to Wikipedia. Whatever your thoughts on Wikipedia, okay, I'll say my thoughts on Wikipedia. I think Wikipedia is awesome. I think it's, it's truly awesome. The quote of Wikipedia, the mission of Jimmy Wales and Wikipedia is share all of the world's information to all of the people for free. And as an educator, I don't know how you can knock that motto. I think Wikipedia has shared incredible amounts of information. And as an educator, if you accept that your job is not necessarily to deliver knowledge, but it's to teach evaluation, then Wikipedia is your friend. Of course, you cannot always trust Wikipedia, but we're to teach evaluation. And so send students to Wikipedia, 
teach them how to evaluate whether the information is valid or not. And I don't think in that sense Wikipedia has cost any teachers their job. Putting out this massive amount of information just creates a different type of goal for the teacher. And that is, you're no longer responsible for delivering the information. You get to move up Bloom's taxonomy and you get to teach evaluation, which to me is a much more satisfying type of teaching. This is from Reuters, and his name is Yuri Milner. And the interesting quote that I would just like to point out, that in only two days in the last year, we will generate, have generated the same amount of information as was generated from the time of the cave drawings to the year 2003. Moreover, 10 years from now, we'll generate that same amount of information in one hour. So we're generating lots and lots of information. I think as instructors, that definitely tells us that our task is no longer to convey information. The information is there. We now need to help evaluate information. And one of the best ways to do that is to use videos to curate information and teach the bigger picture. So I think video is definitely going to increase crowd accelerated innovation. It's going to change teaching, but in my opinion, it's going to change it in an exciting and more innovative way. We're going to teach more than train. So those are my thoughts on why I think teachers should podcast. I hope some of those thoughts are of value to you. Thank you.